and welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark, a two-part episode. First up, we have the author Layla Miller, and her book is Primal Loss, The Now Adult Children of Divorce Speak, and it's published by LCB, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Layla, great to meet you. Nice to meet you, Doug. Uh, primal Loss, I always think of primal therapy from years ago. The Now Adult Children of Divorce Speak. Who are the now adult children, and how did they end up in this book? Mm. So these are people who had uh, their parents divorced when they were either very young children. Some of them actually were older and some of them were even adults when their parents divorced. But they're anyone who has had a break in the family through divorce. And they ended up in the book because I had a friend that I used to talk to, my friend Alicia. And I'm not a child of divorce, but she you is. You kind of semi-dedicated the book to her. I too, did, right? I did, yeah. because she inspired it. And I told her she needed to write about her experience. How did she inspire it? Through normal friendship conversations over the years, we would just talk about um, just normal problems as moms, and every now and then she'd bring up something that I couldn't relate to, and it had to do with her broken family. Uh, and they divorced, I think, when she was nine. But she has a stepmother, she has uh, half or step siblings, things like that. And here she is in her 40s, and she's still dealing with the complications of that Were you broken surprised family. by that? I'm very surprised. I thought, well, this is interesting. I thought people just got over it. You know, when you get used to it, you, I thought you get, the kids get, you know, the parents get divorced and the right. kids get used to it. And so here she was decades later and wasn't over it. So did she consider herself a member of the unhappy club? Um, she, <laughs> she's very quiet about it. You know, you just didn't know. It was very, she's very happy Catholic convert. Um, and so that's why it was just so, it was so subtle. Right. And so I tried to draw that out of her a little bit and say, are you, you know, there seems to be a lot of this. Why don't you write about it? And she right. said, oh, I might. And then she never did, but I ended up writing about it. Okay. Yeah. You, you also point out, and we'll go back to talk about the, the issue itself, but as far as specifically this book, uh, you point out at the, in the introduction what the book is and isn't. The book's not a scholarly work, no methodologies. So Layla, this book itself, uh, you're not a child of divorce. You don't have a bunch of degrees after your name. So what made you the right person to put this together, this particular book, and how did this come about? Well, I think um, the reason I put it together was because I just was curious myself, because I didn't realize, I think, that there were a bunch of people in this culture walking around with encumberments and things on them that I never had, complications I never had. So I just was doing it out of curiosity. And I thought maybe I'd throw out an ebook or make it just something for people to reference if they needed it. But once I started getting these, these uh, questionnaires back, which were just volunteers who said, yes, I'd like to talk about being a child of divorce, uh, I was so blown away by the pain mm -hmm. and the similarities, no matter how many years had passed, that I decided, I, I think I'll just put it in a book. Okay. But I knew that I didn't want my voice in it necessarily. I wanted just I wanted them to have a chance to speak. Well, you kind of leave your voice out for my eight voice chapters is, in the middle, right? Yes, I'm not even speaking in most right. of the book. Eight, okay. eight of those chapters is just a question and the 70 or so answers uh, in each of those chapters. So. And you you identify the people in the books by a one through 70 number mm -hmm. ID. Why did you decide to do that? So that so that people could see maybe this correlation because stories are different and, mm -hmm. and you could follow one particular person's story to see if you might find that relatable? Right, if they were curious about if this is this a male, is this a female, how old, okay. how long ago was the divorce, mm -hmm. how many divorces have been in the family, things like that. And are, and are they married now or are they divorced now right. themselves? Things like that. So I thought demographically people would want that. And you talk about who should read the book. The book is for uh, adult children of divorce, for adults considering divorce. Why adults considering divorce? Well, I've had people say that they've read 10 pages of the, f of the book and they've decided they could never divorce after what they saw, even in the first 10 pages. It's a very difficult read. Mm -hmm. um, People have to and stop and put it chapter. aside. That's the longest chapter. That's the chapter on the effects of divorce, or what mm -hmm. do you think the effects of your parents' divorce were on your life? And it's a painful read. Um, it's painful for parents who have been divorced. It's painful for the children who finally realize, gosh, this is my story, but I've never heard anyone else tell it before. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, it's very powerful for anyone who's considering divorce because I don't think we know in this culture what the ramifications right. are. We haven't been told. Right. And the kids don't speak because the kids, they, they kind of spout the narrative of the parents because they love their parents. And when you're young, you just, you go along with what you're told is a good thing. Right. So, um, 
we don't want to lay a guilt trip no, on anybody. No, of course not. Yes, right. exactly. Somebody so, might feel bad. Somebody might feel bad. And you'd be intolerant because by bringing it up, you'd say that somehow this person wasn't the equal of somebody else, or exactly. they're somehow they're lesser. Exactly. It's right. all and built you're very, into very the, judgmental. Exactly. It's okay. all built into that culture right. that we have around us today. So. You say the book is for divorced parents who initiated or defend their divorces as right and good. You go on to say this book is not to beat you up, but to open your eyes and heart. Have you seen that from people yes. who read this book? Yes. Oh, my goodness. I had a woman who wrote to me last week, and she said, uh, I'm 70, she was 70-some years old. Her son is 43 now. They got divorced when her son was 17. She said, I never knew, but I saw his story in there. No, it's not literally his story, right. but she saw something that echoed and mirrored right. their, their situation. She said, I decided, even though I'm the one who left, she left her husband, she said, I sat him down when he came to visit and I showed him the book and we talked about it. And she said, I could see his entire countenance, everything about him just relaxed when I apologized for what I did so many years ago. And she said, I didn't try to make any excuse whatsoever. I just said I was sorry for what happened to his family. And she said, I myself feel so much lighter, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, that's exactly what I had hoped for the book, and mm -hmm. that is what I'm getting back, is some healing between the right. parents and the children, as and well as... a chance as to open a dialogue. Absolutely. And maybe realize Absolutely. that maybe these things do need to be talked about. They do. This was also about. interesting. You talk about the books for children of attack families so they can understand, mm -hmm. and probably also when they're dealing maybe with a potential spouse who maybe yes. didn't come from an intact family and how that might impact uh, what we see sometimes is a reluctance to commitment these days Yes. In, in relationships. You say this book is for Catholic priests, therapists, for any ministers and counselors who work with those in trouble managers, marriages. I beg you and the children of divorce beg you, save for extreme cases where there's no other possible choice, do not counsel for divorce. You go in and say, I've personally referred couples and I guess to therapists and to priests who have planted seeds of divorce and annulment in couples' minds. Yes. That is unfortunately true. I have seen that. Mm -hmm. I have had friends even come to me and say, after I have referred them to certain counselors, Catholic counselors or Catholic priests, and they were not looking for divorce. They were not looking for anything other than help mm -hmm. in a difficult time. And they were told that it would be okay you know, if you left your husband or if you left your wife. And I've had people come and actually cry to me and say, that's not what I wanted. And so then the people who do want that and who do want permission are getting it fairly, fairly easily mm -hmm. from many priests and counselors in the Catholic Church. And again, I, I attribute that to the fact that this culture is the air they breathe too. We're, we're just surrounded in right. it. And um, it is acceptable today in ways that it wasn't before. And priests are human, and right. counselors are human. But I'm trying to give a warning. Please right. don't do this. They're impacted by society and they the are. culture around them they are. as well. Well, the, the forward with uh, mm. uh, Dr. Jennifer Roback Morse has been on EWTM many times. The divorce ideology is one of the linchpins of the sexual revolution. Kids are resilient. Uh, parents who don't get along do their kids no favor by staying married. That certainly was the approach that was promulgated in the late 60s throughout the 70s. Uh, the idea that uh, divorce is harmless to children, and she goes on to make the point that unfortunately these claims are false, brings chaos in the family, and experts used to say the kids will get over it. That's not what you're hearing from not the kids, right? at all. Not at all. The oldest contributor is 66 in this book. Um, most of them are in their middle age. Uh, it is devastating, and, and this is what I never knew. This is why I'm so passionate about this subject. I did not realize that it doesn't end. Mm -hmm. For the children of divorce, it never, it never ends. They're, they're navigating these complicated situations and their pain and their um, insecurities throughout their entire lives. It doesn't end for them. It may end for the parents who go on and find another romance, or, uh, but it does not end for the kids. And that's something no one ever mentioned and no one ever, ever told anyone. Right. So. Well, she goes on to say, sustaining the divorce ideology requires that people don't ask too many questions or voice too many objections. Goes on to say, to keep the fantasy alive, anyone who does not allow, does not follow the socially approved divorce script must be silenced. Have you had any of that? Oh, yes. And I've been absolutely shocked by it. Anytime I discuss the book, mm -hmm. especially if it's on any kind of social media, immediately come the 
condemnations or the silencing. Mm -hmm. Like, well, you can't, you know, you're hurting people by saying this. You can't say this, you know, people are abused, people need to get out. And I always make the caveat, I always make the right. caveat that Which, the church says if it's danger, if it's sure. unlivable, you can get out. Right. That is not most cases of divorce. So, yes, but it is uncanny. And, and I, again, since this is not my wound, I'm not a child of divorce, I can take those right. slings and arrows. But the children of divorce, and they talk to me privately, a lot of them, not just the ones in this book, but else, elsewhere, they will say, that's why we don't say anything. Because the minute we open our mouths, we are told to be quiet because we're, we're upsetting the adults. We're upsetting the parents who divorced and we're not allowed to do that. Right. So. Uh, they may tell the child, we still love you, we just don't love each other. The child cannot make sense of this impossible contradiction. In my opinion, this is the underlying reason for the well-documented psychological, physiological, and spiritual risks that children of divorce face. Now, you talk about, and she talks about, uh, some of the powerful testimonies in this book, even to the point of it not necessarily always being that pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still drink wine and cry when you read some of these things <laughs> as you talk about in the book? Yeah, it's one of those, that is, <laughs> that's what I tell everyone, just get a box of Kleenex <laughs> and a glass of wine before you sit down with this book. There are uh, all, there's a whole spectrum of types of divorces in this book. Uh, some were very neat and clean and, and lovely and friendly and some were, you know, lots of abuse and uh, drug abuse, alcoholism, adultery, all sorts of things. Uh, the pain, though, is palpable with all the kids in every way and it is it's a difficult read there are suicides involved siblings and parents and um, that was a big theme right. to uh, a lot of acting out behavioral issues um, so right. much pain and then the pain that still exists between the parents right. and the kids because there's not always been healing right and that's the thing too and you have a, a chapter a contributors chapter I've included another chapter testimonies chapter 10 that are um, you know from people who have stories of hope etc so yes. it's not all but again yeah. it's one of those things where it is painful and that's why to some degree you get pushback because no one necessarily initially goes into something to re-experience a pain they they might have had to deal with before yes and they don't want to know Truly, and I can understand as a parent, you don't want to know the pain you've caused your child. Right, exactly. So. Okay, well thank you so much, uh, Layla Miller, author of Primal Loss, The Now Adult Children of Divorce Speak, available through our religious catalog. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. here. And stay with us here on Bookmark, another book straight ahead. two of this special bookmark with Ryan and Mary Rose Verrett, authors of Witness to Love, How to Help the Next Generation Build Marriages that Survive and Thrive, published by uh, St. Benedict Press. Welcome to EWTN's Thank bookmark. You. It's great to have you here. People us. will have seen you. You've been on uh, Jim and Joy's show a couple of times talking about uh, marriage and obviously about Witness to Love, your, your new book. Well, let me ask you, Ryan, uh, why'd you decide to write a book on this topic? Uh, the reason why we decided to write a book was something, it wasn't something that was part of the initial plan. I guess when we were preparing for marriage ourselves and thinking about marriage, but uh, several years ago we were trying to figure out why young couples who we were working with in marriage prep were not coming to Mass after the wedding day. Mm -hmm. And then we sort of discovered um, sort of a new approach to marriage prep, pairing them up with uh, a mentors that they, they would choose. Mm -hmm. And when we started seeing a um, sort of a, uh, a change in our divorce statistics in the parish and, and parish involvement, mm -hmm. uh, there was a suggestion that Mary Rose had a presentation in Ohio, right? You could fill in on right. that. Right. We, we had got the divorce rate down from 23% at five years after the wedding day uh, down to zero mm -hmm. in, the, in the parish. And then we got church attendance up from 10% for newlyweds up to 70 and then eventually 90%. Which which was, was huge, and so uh, we were invited to give a presentation in Dayton, Ohio uh, mm -hmm. for the National Association of Family Life Ministers uh, a number of years ago, and uh, at that presentation, there were supposed to be five or 10 people at the breakout, and there were 70 family life directors, mm -hmm. and they just said, we need this. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't just have this in your head and give a little talk on it and use it at your parish. You have mm -hmm. to share this, and so uh, 
we talked with a number of publishers, and uh, St. Benedict Press was, uh, I would say, the most enthusiastic mm -hmm. about uh, working with us and right. this topic, and they were they were great to work with. And so, uh, they basically told us, you you need to put something together that any married couple could say, hey. I, I want to help other couples. I want to share my marriage. I want to be a mentor, but I don't know how. So how where. is this different than, let's say, Marriage Encounter might have been, or Pre-Cana was, or those kind of, you know, marriage prep in general. What's different about this? Why does this work? I would say this, this new model of uh, really and instead of having a we call it forced fun marriage prep where you know the couples are there uh, tons of couples in a room mm -hmm. with people they don't know listening to people they don't know about topics they've never heard about you know mm -hmm. it's all so new and it's so um, in some sense isolating and it doesn't really have a good uh, track record of continuation like the couples don't integrate into the church and so this was a, a whole new approach where you say okay who in your life do you admire whose marriage do you admire bring them to us and we will form them to walk with you basically an accompanying couple as opposed mm -hmm. to just a mentor couple and they're not just walking along mm -hmm. together skipping along right. they are uh, growing in virtue together they're having conversations and this book has a lot of those conversations in it well yeah Ryan I was thinking in terms of that of our present Holy Father talking about encountering and bringing people along which is the important part and I think that's what you try and right. point out in this book as you deal with one of the strong issues what do you say to a cohabitating couple because a lot of people wonder about encountering and leaving people where they are rather than leading them where they need to go. But you also say, I was struck by their unhealthy isolation, this is an engaged couple, from friends and family, they lived in their own world, preventing them from welcoming input from others. So that's something you found in younger couples today. Yeah, the, the tendency for young couples, millennials, the generation Y, and all these I, I generation I, they, they're, they're so comfortable in this isolated, separated from a community life, in particular separated from a parish mm -hmm. uh, that's in their, in their neighborhood or that they should have grown up in or maybe they were baptized in. And, and that, that sort of, to piggyback on what Mary Rose was saying, they haven't had um, the experiential sort of knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding of marriage that maybe generations before have had so that we have the solid intellectual formation mm -hmm. from some great programs in the past. We have all the right books, we have the right videos, but they haven't seen marriage. It's sort of like we're in Advent right now, right? And so we needed the incarnation in addition to the Ten Commandments. We mm -hmm. needed to sort of see um, relationships the way God designed them to be in permanence, uh, but lived out. Mm -hmm. you know? It's it's not see you know that experiential understanding of marriage couples today. If they didn't grow up in a home where their parents were married or their parents weren't happily married, mm -hmm. they don't know what marriage is supposed to look like. Right. And then they go into college and they come out of college and they just they have either a romance novel or you know some other right. version right. of marriage in their mm -hmm. mind. Well, what do you say to somebody who says Mary Rose, you're you're a nice Catholic young lady and you had a wonderful family and that's mm -hmm. why you had these wonderful experiences. So many other people haven't had those good experiences. Is that your background? Uh, no, my parents are divorced. Mm -hmm. um, my grandparents are divorced on both sides. Uh, I actually didn't meet a couple who was happily married uh, until I was in college. Uh, I went to Christendom College, and uh, it was Dr. John Cudaback uh, mm -hmm. and his wife uh, and their family that for me it was a whole new world. Until then I had never actually considered marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so for me that really, that was a starting point. And then also an encounter I had with John Paul II that mm -hmm. was just very healing, uh, where he said you're not the sum of your fears and failures, but you're the sum of a father's love for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really, uh, for me, was right. that changed everything. Now you talk about also I think the importance of trust, which people talk about in relationships, and also in relation to your program having to do with the mentors, you say, one day we heard that a couple with whom we had worked had gone through all the requirements and met for months with their well-formed mentors was now divorced. The engaged couple never established a trusting relationship with them and did not approach them during their difficulty. So what did you do different to deal with that? Yeah, so that, that was the whole thing. We realized that the 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 only way we would have contact with this newly married couple was through some existing relationship that they had before the wedding day. In the past, with these, when the mentors are just being assigned, and we, there is a role for that sort of the expert in the, in the parish when it comes to the sacrament of matrimony, if you call, want to call it an expert, but we need to make sure that they actually have some insight, not to just one hour a week, what's going on with these young couples. Because again, these young couples are not coming from an integrated 
parish life, of a family life, they're, they're isolated and we need to call them from that. But we realized that not, if they didn't trust the mentor that was assigned to them, that was the, the point that we saw over and over again. The mentors that were assigned to them, they didn't really trust them, they didn't really share. You know, it's for example, like let's use NFP an example. I mean, how many, how many Catholics have not sort of taken the next step in, with, with regards to NFP because they were maybe paired with somebody that just really gave them the intellectual formation which is essential, mm -hmm. but never really can call them into sort of a conversion right. that Christ has revealed. The well, well, I think, yeah, and you talk about here, Mary Rose, the idea of this disunion that we see in marriage today, that God, the author of marriage, and that's what I think people lose sight of today, has been removed from the relationship between men and women to the point where oftentimes they reference God was removed from the wedding bounds, and, and with, with having that missing, you lose that sense of the sacrament and the permanence. Yes, right. Pe people aren't ready to invest in it. The, the, the wedding vows are different, the understanding is different. Many people, they go to their wedding day and, and they don't even know until the rehearsal what the wedding vows are. They don't know what they're committing to. They're not paying attention during marriage prep. So they really, it has to start long before the wedding with an up-close personal relationship with, with a couple who is kind of just sharing, going through the wedding vows. This is how I lived it. This is how God worked in, in my marriage. And the mentor couples that they choose, they, they share with us, they said, honestly, we never had marriage prep, or we had it, but we don't remember it, or right. we had it, but it wasn't really very good. So right. for them, this is the marriage prep they never had. And, and as that engaged couple sees the conversion happening for the mm -hmm. mentor couple, it is very powerful because they have a front row seat for this awesome couple whose right. marriage they admire, who's already active in the church, who they trust, who they've asked, right. uh, who's investing in this engaged couple. They, they see and they can receive and that witness. And without that witness, from somebody you, um, you're you attracted to, you have a relationship with, and you trust, mm -hmm. that witness doesn't really permeate. And that really is what right. sets witness to love apart, is that attraction, relationship, and trust dynamic right. that's well, going may on. Maybe in some of those old pre caners they spent their time playing Scrabble. <laughs> uh, who's Possible. the terrible Scrabble player, and what does that have to do with marriage? Well, I like Scrabble a well, lot. Well, <laughs> I'm the terrible Scrabble player, and... We work um, on it, though. This, uh, the story you're referring <laughs> to <funny> is, <laughs> uh, I don't do well at Scrabble, and so I don't really want to play. Mm -hmm. But the same with marriage, uh, when, when we were getting married, we really believed the divorce rate was 50%. We did. Mm -hmm. But that divorce statistic is uh, quite a, uh, a wet blanket, mm -hmm. and it's not true. So if somebody gets married five times, they've also gotten divorced five times. Right. That messes with the divorce statistic. We get married for the first time, our indicators for divorce are very different. Mm -hmm. How long you've known each other, how much you spend on the wedding, the honeymoon, the ring, all those things right, actually... Right, you have that factors yes, in the book, which are interesting in the book. to see. Right, exactly. It's fascinating. Right, how that ties in. Also, remember when we discussed sliding into marriage versus mm -hmm. choosing to be married? What's the difference? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So sliding into marriage, you think how young people got to know each other. Mary Rose and I had an interesting story. We met sort of the, in this ice storm in Virginia, and I was trying to sleep in the uh, in the cry room because I was out of electricity. It's a whole other story. You have to read the book. It's a great story. Um, but I know the idea, though, that most young people today meet in a bar um, mm -hmm. or in some social gathering like that where there's alcohol. Um, usually they uh, go to someone's house that evening. Um, and uh, they get comfortable there. Somebody's clothes stays. Um, they're there for a while. Somebody says, well, we might as well let go of the other place. We don't need to have consolidate. two rents. Consolidate, right? right? Yeah, very practical. They're right. doing that for three or four years, two years or so. Somebody in the family says, oh, maybe it's time to get married, right? Mm -hmm. Or a kid and comes so along. Kid comes along, so right. they get married. So the whole idea, basically, there was never really a decisive, intentional discernment mm -hmm. and sort of a, a, a general thought as what's the best for us, and particularly this other person, right? right. That, what is the best thing for this and other person? And so they sort, of, right. they sort of slide into it, you know, and then they just never really prepare right. themselves. And that's why you also talk about those who are kind to their future spouses will have a much higher chance of marital success. That seems like, of course you're kind, but I, I guess that's not the situation. You also have a couple other ones in, in this chapter where you say, how often a couple goes to church mm -hmm. is a positive indicator. An overly conserved attitude about one's future spouse's appearance is a red flag and an indicator of divorce. That's, and also this one, if the bride has a poor relationship with her father, it will increase a couple's odds of divorce. Is that also true with the, the man with the wife, or is that Not as unique, much, though. Really? It's, it's unique. And then there's a, an additional thing to that. If the bride develops a good relationship with her father-in-law, 
it can uh, counteract that. So there's just a lot of interesting things that if, if engaged couples knew this, mm -hmm. even before they were engaged, you know, what to do before you say I do, a lot of that mm -hmm. is in this book as well. So, you know, it's not necessarily just for mentors. There's right. so many things that, you know, if you were single or considering right. dating or engaged that you would want to read. Give you insights yes. into this. Uh, exactly. After I do, continuing the mentorship. The worst thing that can be found in a relationship was contempt. Was that surprising? Uh, no, because contempt is basically saying, I don't really care mm -hmm. about what you say, what you do, what you think, how you feel. Indifference. Apathy. Yeah, right. But just like, just, just whatever. Right. You also say, we also ask couples and kind of, I guess, plays off that. In the end, is your personal preference worth the damage it can do to your marriage and relationship? Mm -hmm. But do doesn't our culture tell us that that's really important because if I care about this, you should do this for me? Right, it's 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 uh, what they call uh, like codependency, mm -hmm. interdependency. You know, he's going all this like how can how can we kind of let certain things go, respect things, um, just leadership. Uh, yeah. You know, really, you know, we, we're both very strong-willed right. people. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and and that that for right. us has been kind of you know that's right. well, that fits back into what you're talking uh, about with, with John Paul too, and the whole idea of self-donation. We're yes. gonna have to leave it at that. Thank you so much, Mary Rose Verrett and Ryan, yeah. for your book *Witness to Love: How to Help the Next Generation Build Marriages That Survive and Thrive*, and also our first book, *Primal Loss*. The Now Adult Children of Divorce Speak by Layla Miller, both available through the EWT and Religious Catalog, EWTRC.com. Great if you're trying to figure out where you're going with your marriage or whether you're thinking about marriage or you know somebody who could use some information about marriage. It takes a lot these days. I'm Doug Keck. We'll see you next time right here on Book